Should you use digestive enzymes to help with gas, bloating, and other digestive problems? And if yes, which one can you try? I get this question very often, so I'm making this video to answer it, and in order to do that, first thing I'm going to talk about, quick overview of the digestive process in order to help me explain my answer. Number two, I am going to make a broad recommendation for what you can try or to look for. And then the third thing, I am going to share some of my concerns about using digestive enzymes in protocols, so make sure you watch until the end. My name is Noor Zibde. I am a functional and integrative dietitian, and I help people overcome digestive discomforts, IBS, H. pylori, food sensitivities, autoimmune flare-ups, all using personalized diet and supplement plans, as well as lifestyle strategies. And in this video, we're going to talk about digestive enzymes. So let's start to talk about digestion. What happens to your food when you eat it? The first step of digestion is in the mouth your salivary glands are going to produce amylase, and this is the enzyme that is going to start the breakdown of carbohydrates and starches. And that's why it's very important to chew your food thoroughly and to take your time because this actually activates digestion, so don't swallow very quickly. Then the food is going to go to the stomach. In the stomach, we have the enzyme pepsin, which is going to start the digestion of protein, and pepsin needs to be activated by hydrochloric acid or HCL or stomach acid. And so we need both things and both of those are produced by the cells that line the stomach. We also have gastric lipase and lipase is an enzyme that's going to start the breakdown of fats in the stomach that's also produced by the cells that line the stomach. Then when the food leaves the stomach, it is at the beginning of the small intestine, the pancreas, which is a gland that sits right below or behind the stomach, is going to produce what we call pancreatic elastase which is made of three major enzymes, pancreatic amylase, which breaks down carbohydrates and starches, protease that breaks down the protein, and lipase that breaks down the lipids or the fats. So as the food moves out of the stomach, they're going to get mixed up with these enzymes. And then the gallbladder is going to get the message that bile is needed, food is here. So the gallbladder will release bile, and bile is produced by the liver throughout the day, gets stored in the gallbladder. And then when we eat, the gallbladder is going to release a lot of it into the beginning of the small intestine. So for people without a gallbladder, they could be dripping bile throughout the day. And so when the meal comes, there could be enough for uh, bile. We don't know. That's another topic. So now the food is in the beginning of the small intestine. And the pancreatic elastase enzymes, think of those as big scissors. That's how I usually explain those to my clients. So imagine that your food is a bunch of pearl necklaces that got tangled together, and now the enzymes are going to come and separate them. We actually need each pearl by itself in order to absorb it. So the pancreatic elastase are like the big scissors. They're going to come and cut chunks throughout the big mess. And in order to give us smaller compounds that are easier for our little enzymes to work on. So they're really important to do a bulk of the work, but they don't finalize the work. So that's pancreatic elastase. And then the bile is actually not an enzyme. These are salts. They come and then like disperse themselves in between the fat. So that helps the lipase enzyme to start to work properly. And also some of the fat molecules that are really small, they can get absorbed through the bile right there. So it helps with digestion and absorption, even though it's not an actual enzyme. Now the food is in the small intestine. We are going to have the brush border cells, which are the cells in the small intestine, release enzymes. So these are the enzymes that do the final work. This is the detailed work. These are including lactase. You might have heard of lactase enzyme or sucrase or maltase or invertase. So these enzymes are going to do the final job. These are going to break the double sugars into their single individual units that we can absorb safely. And the, any problems with the small intestine, such as SIBO or fungal overgrowth in the small intestine or gastroenteritis issues or parasites or anything in the small intestine is going to interfere with these enzymes. And then after we digest the food to its single individual units, we absorb what we can absorb, what we need to absorb. And then the rest goes to the large intestine. This is where water gets absorbed, some salts, and then the bacteria in our colon, which should be beneficial, 
will take the fiber that we don't have the enzyme to break, such as cellulose, for example, and they're going to break down the fiber and make beneficial compounds for us, such as short chain fatty acids like butyrate and others. And that's how we benefit from a good, healthy microbiome. And then the rest will come out as waste. As you see, there are multiple steps in digestion and each step is going to depend on the step before it in order to function properly. So when it comes to answering the question, which digestive enzyme should you try? The answer is really going to depend on where is the bottleneck? Where is the problem in your digestive process? Is it because you're not chewing your food properly and that's all you need to do? Is it because you have a problem in your stomach, such as H. pylori maybe, or not enough stomach acid? Do you have SIBO? Is there something else? Do you have a gallbladder problem? Is your pancreas healthy? Which also healthy elastase production depends on having adequate stomach acidity. So it all depends on the step before it and they all work in harmony to break down a piece of bread or a piece of meat into amino acids and carb sugars, like single sugars and fatty acids that are going to be beneficial for us. So which enzyme should you try? Like, which, what do you do? In general, some of you may know what is going on and you have an official diagnosis and some people may be on their own health journey trying to answer this question. So I'm always more cautious when I am making a general recommendation. If you are going to try, pick up a supplement for digestive enzymes over the counter, I would go with something that has a general broad spectrum and enzymes and you would want to read the label, maybe some amylase, some protease, some lipase, but see if they also have the individual enzymes like lactase and sucrase and maltase and things like that. These help address multiple steps of the digestive process and they may be safer than other things. And I'm going to talk about my concerns in the next point about digestive enzymes. Now, keep it in mind that we don't have a unit to measure, like compare enzymes. So it's not all like measured in grams or milligrams, like some supplements. So they are going to come in different units. And sometimes it's not easy to compare. Sometimes you might need to take more than one capsule than what the bottle label says in order to see results. Sometimes the product may just not be the solution for the problem that you have. It might just not be the right thing. It might not work at all. And keeping in mind that we're all very different in what is lacking and what is what needs to be addressed. So give it a try, but keeping in mind the concerns I'm going to be sharing next as you look at products online or if you go to a store. Now, just a reminder, if you like this content, make sure that you like and subscribe so that more people who are looking for this kind of information can see it as well. So as you look for over-the-counter enzyme supplements, here's what you need to be careful of. Number one, I have a big concern with hydrochloric acid and pepsin just being anybody trying them all the time for everything. If you have gastritis or acid reflux or ulcers, or if you have H. pylori and you don't know it, taking hydrochloric acid when the stomach is damaged is going to make it worse. Imagine that you're pouring acid on a wound that has not healed. It is going to hurt more and then possibly make the H. pylori harder to eradicate. Also, a lot of these supplements contain pepsin enzyme. And for people with LPR or silent reflux that they may not have heartburn symptoms, but you may have soreness in your throat or hoarseness or trouble swallowing or mucus or even ear issues, this could be acid related. And for these people, pepsin enzyme travels from the stomach to the throat and the esophagus, and that can actually cause us more irritation and damage. So you start taking pepsin with hydrochloric acid, you can make your underlying problem worse. So I'm very careful with this, even though in theory, a lot of digestive problems stem from not having enough stomach acid. You got to do the work of healing your stomach and addressing the underlying problem before you earn the right to take a lot of hydrochloric acid. So just be careful with that. Number two, some of the supplements are made from food derived ingredients, such as the bromelain made from pineapple and papain made from papaya. And while these are natural enzymes, some people have food sensitivities. So when I test my patients, sometimes pineapple is a problem, sometimes papaya or other things. So if you try a product and it doesn't make you feel okay, makes you feel weird, there could be underlying food sensitivity. Synthetic enzymes don't have food sensitivity concern, but they are derived from fermentation of yeast and fungus. So while most people will be okay with them, 
people with yeast and mold and fungal issues may have a negative response to yeast derived supplements. So again, this is something why there's not a one solution and one answer to everyone. And my final concern with digestive enzymes is that they're still a band-aid. They are better than other band-aids, but they still don't fix the problem. So if your problem is inflammation in the small intestine, or bacterial overgrowth, or the lining is not healing and intact, and you have uh, giardia or parasite or like whatever you have, and you don't address that, you can take enzymes every single day of your life, but it's not going to fix the problem. It doesn't fix SIBO, it doesn't fix H. pylori, it doesn't fix the underlying problem. So I think it's okay and there's room for it as part of a healing protocol, but it's not the solution. And at some point you want to heal the underlying problem, get your body and your digestive tract in a situation where it can produce its own enzymes without all the extra help and the extra support. I hope this was helpful to give you an idea of what you can try on your own. But if you're looking for long-term solutions that are based on evidence, based on your own testing, based on your symptoms and your medical history, this is what I do with my one-to-one -one clients. So you can click on the link in the description to learn more about what I do and how I help my clients. And you can book a strategy, an assessment session with me to go over what's going on with you and how we can work together. I hope this was helpful. If you have other questions, make sure you write in the comments and I'll do my best to come back and answer them as much as I can. Have a good one.